Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all uh, for being here uh, for Manukin opening day. Um, it, just in case any of you, thank you, uh, are interested in the other opening day, the Royals are ahead one to nothing in the top of the sixth. Um, and we, we attribute that to Bob being here uh, tonight. So I'm going to mention, uh, before I introduce Bob, uh, I want to mention a couple of upcoming programs. We have a particularly uh, great uh, uh, set of programs in the month of April. Um, and uh, so I want to mention, uh, will be of interest, I think, to this uh, audience. Some of you know, uh, will we'll have seen, she's done a number of events in Kansas City now, uh, including two at the library, uh, Sonia Warshawski, uh, uh, Big Sonia. Uh, well, at the, at the, when I did a conversation with her at the Plaza Library in the front row, there was a, a woman that some of you may know, uh, also a Holocaust survivor, uh, Gitla Doppelt. Um, and we'll be, we'll be doing a program with Gitla. Uh, we'll be showing the film that her family, she actually is portrayed in on Monday, April 8th, and, uh, and a conversation with her on uh, Tuesday, April 9th at the Plaza Library. Um, some of you will have seen the Daniel Craig movie, Defiance. It's actually about her family. She's in the movie, or, or someone portraying her. Uh, and it, of course, like Sonia's story, uh, is an extraordinary story. So look forward to, to that. Um, we also have the return of one of our favorite people, uh, Harvard professor, also a Harvard professor, uh, Leo Damrosch, uh, emeritus uh, from the English department at Harvard, who's been here with his great biography of Jonathan Swift, his great book about Tocqueville in America. Um, he has just published uh, uh, The Club about Johnson, Boswell, Burke, Reynolds, Garrick, et cetera, Goldsmith, The Club, uh, uh, meeting uh, at the Turk's Head Tavern uh, uh, in, in London, probably the greatest uh, uh, aggregation, uh, certainly in the English-speaking world, of uh, minds and talent ever. And it's a great book, and Leo's a wonderful uh, speaker. He'll be here on also on April 9th, so you've got a choice. He'll be here at the Central Library. Gita, Gitla will be um, at the Plaza. Um, and then also uh, the cover of our uh, April calendar, uh, Vartan Gregorian will be coming back to Kansas City. In 2002, he gave a wonderful talk uh, called Libraries as an Act of Civic Renewal that really kicked off the campaign to buy and renovate this building as a central library. Uh, and it is a wonderful uh, a view of civilized values and their, their importance in a very civilized community like ours. And uh, uh, he'll be coming back. He's been, as you're probably aware, the director of the New York Public Library. Uh, he's been uh, the president of Brown University, and he's currently the CEO, president of the, the Carnegie Corporation, the Carnegie Foundation, uh, and he's an extraordinary man. Uh, and I look forward to, to, to talking with him on Thursday, April 18th here at the Central Library. And there will be a special guest appearance. He's busy tonight, uh, but we'll have a special guest appearance in our conversation with, with Vartan, with his son, Vahi Gregorian, who some of you will know as a sports writer for the Kansas City Star. Um, and then, uh, last but not least, uh, I want to mention that uh, the, uh, the great poet Molly Peacock uh, will be here uh, talking on April 25th, or actually she'll be at the Plaza Library on April 25th. So, a lot going on at the Kansas City Public Library, but nothing more important. Oh, I'm sorry. Talk louder. Thanks, Randy. Um, so, <laughs> Robert Manukin is a Kansas City boy who made good. Uh, yeah, he, he's a, a fellow graduate uh, with me of the Pembroke Hill School for Wayward Boys. Um, <laughs> he survived that experience uh, and an economics degree at Harvard uh, to begin his real life as a legal scholar. He graduated from Harvard Law, clerk for Justice Harlan, Supreme Court Justice Harlan, uh, taught at Berkeley, at, at Oxford, at Columbia, at Stanford, uh, and they finally let him back into Harvard, where he's now the Williston professor. Um, uh, he uh, is probably the leading expert, the legal expert on the science and art of negotiating uh, and chairs the committee uh, on, uh, of the negotiation program uh, at Harvard. Um, he is the great student of conflict uh, resolution, uh, but also a practitioner uh, and has uh, been involved in famous cases uh, such as, involved, been significantly involved, such as I, the IBM versus uh, Fujitsu. He was last here with his book, Bargaining with the Devil, uh, 
Now I'd like to give you a few words because I, I've read it and I really admire this book, a few words about the current book. Um, uh, this is a story, uh, uh, there is a story in the Jewish American Paradox, this book, and by the way, we, have, we only have about 10 copies left, so you know, I expect uh, at the end of Bob's talk that there will be a rush to buy those 10 copies in the hall. And it's about Christmas trees, Christmas trees and Jewish identity. My best friend, uh, since the age of four, was Jewish, still is. Um, <laughs> And sometime around the age of eight or nine, he took me to B'nai Yehuda, and, uh, and it wasn't for the first time. Uh, we, we, we swapped uh, re religious ex experiences. And the, the rabbi that day, uh, must have been around Christmas time, gave a, a, a talk about uh, uh, how uh, Christmas trees were not something that good Jews should have, uh, the evils of Christmas trees. I was a little shocked. Um, you know, my first thought was, poor Paul, He'll have to give back his presents, and uh, how, how, can I, how can I do something for him, uh, save him from that fate? My second thought was, finally, I'll have more presents than Paul, <laughs> my impure thought. Um, but it, it was uh, it, th that story and uh, a number of other stories at the beginning of, of this book, um, uh, in uh, what is a journey, a pathway through uh, identity, uh, uh, not just Jewish identity, but really how we form identity. Um, it is a fine book, uh, a very sophisticated and complex, but very accessible look at Jewish identity, uh, and also at identity politics, the reshaping, undermining, breaking out, expansion, narrowing, particularizing of identity that is so prevalent in American society in all ways, uh, ultimately for all of us, uh, regardless of whether Uh, near the beginning, he talks about being a student of the great psychologist Eric Erickson, the author uh, of great books on psychobiographies of uh, Luther and Gandhi, who I was reading uh, at the same time uh, he was, I was a student of Erickson's. Uh, and, and, and he is the great analyst, uh, I think, the, Erickson, the great analyst of uh, the shaping of identity. Uh, and so it was very uh, shocking to, I think, to, to, to Robert Mnookin, as it was to me to read Morris Berman's uh, review in the New York Times uh, about Erickson's evasion of his Jewish identity. His mother was Jewish, he grew up, uh, was bar, uh, Jewish at bar mitzvah, et cetera. Um, Bob's review of this is uh, uh, an e empathetic interpretation of the dilemmas uh, of identity, of Erickson's dilemmas of identity, of all of us, it seems to me. He suggests in the book a divide between an essentialist view of identity, we're born this way, we are born into doing that, uh, this way, uh, and uh, a more libertarian view, um, uh, Erickson's view, Erickson who ultimately abandoned his Jewish uh, name, abandoned his, his Jewish faith, and renamed himself Eric Erickson, Eric, son of Eric. And, and, and Bob gives us an empathetic uh, view. Uh, takes us through a winding pathway of the importance of uh, race, family, uh, matrimony, religion, uh, the Bible, Torah, Talmud, and Mishnah, genetics, and the definitions of uh, are not only in terms of those things which are given uh, to us, um, uh, but also in terms of the things that are made against us or against Semitism and the Holocaust, uh, uh, defining, defining Judaism or Jewish identity, uh, both in the positive and negative sense. I was reading a book more or less simultaneously uh, with Bob's called Anti-Judaism by a great scholar at the University of Chicago, David Nuremberg, who said, had this, I thought, uh, great line, the history of ideas shapes the possibilities of thought and belief, and also the activities um, that our beliefs make uh, possible. Uh, in, in, in this book, in this very, very excellent book, Bob portrays himself as a libertarian and not a, an essentialist. Secular Jews, reformed Jews, Israeli Jews, American Jews, converts, lap, lapsed Jews, Catholic priests who are Jews. There's a great chapter on a Catholic priest who is a Jew, brother. Uh, can all be Jews in this book. But I say he also uses words 
very essentialist words like generosity and obligation uh, describes a sense in which uh, uh, every description of a just action is a description of something that is essential to uh, our humanity. Now, he's a negotiator by trade, uh, so he's always negotiating some empathy for every side in an argument. Uh, but it isn't utility, ultimately, the utility of a successful negotiation uh, that, uh, that Bob Mnookin is about or that this book is about. It's ultimately about the just results of finding our true identity. So it is a real pleasure and an honor for me to welcome Robert Mnookin to. <laughs> Well, what a pleasure to be here. It goes to show you can come home again. And I feel very much at home, and I am deeply in your debt on opening day for you all to be here. Uh, I actually had my fingers crossed that it would get rained out, but uh, that didn't happen. Uh, almost, almost. Well, my book is about the puzzling nature of Jewish identity in America and the challenges facing uh, the American Jewish community. And what I'd like to do in the next few minutes is uh, really just uh, share a couple stories. Uh, the first story, and I'm gonna abbreviate it because you've already been introduced to it a little bit, is about <clears throat> uh, uh, one of the most influential theorists on the subject of identity, and that's Eric Erickson. <clears throat> Uh, I first met Erickson in 1975. Uh, he had recently retired as a professor at Harvard and had moved back to Marin County, California. And a very distinguished uh, psychoanalyst there decided, who was a friend of Erickson's, Erickson had early in his career had taught at Berkeley, uh, decided he was gonna put together a faculty seminar of about 12 people to meet with Erickson once a month. Erickson at the time was working on uh, ideas about uh, uh, the developmental struggles of people my age, <laughs> uh, uh, older folks. Now at the time I was in my 30s and he of course uh, was in his early 70s. And uh, when I was a student at Harvard, I'd never taken his course, but he was quite a faculty celebrity. He was trained in Vienna as a child psychoanalyst by the Freuds themselves, primarily Anna Freud, uh, but he also was involved with uh, Sigmund Freud. And uh, he taught a perpetually oversubscribed class at Harvard called the Human Life Cycle. Now, Erickson's influence sprang from a developmental theory of identity, which posited that we work through particular challenges associated with eight different stages of life. Freud's original theories of development really hadn't extended past the years of early childhood. And part of Erickson's contribution was really to extend it much further. He coined the phrase, by the way, identity crisis, which he related to an adolescent struggle to develop a strong and cohesive sense of self. And as mentioned by Crosby, he also wrote two biographies and in fact had championed the idea of what some have called psychohistory. These were psychobiographies. One was of Martin Luther, the other was of Gandhi. And the latter won the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award. Quite an unusual achievement uh, for a mental health uh, professional. Now, I took an immediate liking to Erickson. At 72, he was a very handsome man with blue eyes, a light ruddish complexion, and a striking mane of white hair. And although courtly, he dressed very informally. And like my grandfather, George Sittenfeld, he wore a Western string tie with a striking piece of jewelry as a clasp. Soft-spoken, he had an accent. It sort of sounded German to me, but I didn't know. And from his name and appearance, I assumed he was Scandinavian. Well, what uh, Crosby didn't relate was a very interesting story. We were at a dinner party with Erickson during the course of uh, the time I got to know him. And he sat next to Dale at this party, my wife Dale, right here in the front row. And uh, Erickson said to Dale, what kind of name is Manukin? 
And Dale said, reported, that it came from a Hebrew word meaning something like at rest or peaceful. Uh, and he asked Dale whether she was Jewish. And she replied she was, and he said, you don't look Jewish. <laughs> then, as if to explain his questions, he said with apparent modesty, I write about identity, you know. Dale did know, of course, that he wrote about identity. But what neither of us knew was the importance that Erickson himself attached to not looking Jewish and not having a Jewish name. And we found that out during the course of this seminar because of a New York Times front page book review uh, with the provocative title, Eric Erickson, the man who invented himself. The front page story of the March 30th, 1975 Sunday book review section included a beautiful paragraph of Erickson with his magnificent head of white hair. And it was written as mentioned by Marshall Berman, a city college professor and a Harvard PhD who had studied with Erickson. It was presumably a review of Erickson's most recent book, Life History and the Historical Moment, a collection of essays, most of which had been published before. The first paragraph of the review could not have been more complimentary. Quote, Eric Erickson is probably the closest thing to an intellectual hero in American culture today. Uh, several paragraphs later, Berman revealed what for me was a complete surprise. Quote, like many of the outstanding intellectuals of our time, Erickson grew up as a Jew in Imperial, Weim Imperial and Weimar Germany and crossed the water to America during the Hitler years to fulfill a vital, vital inner need. The vital inner need, according to Berman, was to abandon his Jewish and German refugee status and reinvent himself as a man of Danish Gentile ancestry. Berman's harshest criticisms focused on what Erickson had omitted from his autobiographical essay in, the, in this volume. In the essay, Berman thought in bad faith, uh, Erickson had mentioned uh, that his stepfather, Dr. Theodore Homberger, a pediatrician, was Jewish and that he had been raised as a Jew, but Erickson failed to state that his mother, nay Carla Abramson, was Jewish too. Second, as mentioned, Erickson had changed his surname as an adult after having grown up with Homberger's name, his stepfather's name, and having been raised in his household. And the name change, according to Berman, represented Erickson's repudiation of his stepfather, whose Jewish name he should normally bear. Now, the new surname Erickson had chosen was not his birth father's name because Erickson never knew who his father was. Uh, Berman noted, quote, the cosmic chutzpah of his claim to be Eric Erickson, his own father in the most literal sense, a self-made man. Uh, Erickson, according to Berman, had been a victim of Nazism, and yet he implied that he'd really come to America voluntarily not that he was any, under any pressure uh, uh, to leave. Well, the review did more than accuse Erickson of dishonesty about his Jewish heritage. It suggested that in evading or denying his Jewishness, Erickson was inauthentic and lived his life inconsistently with his own developmental theories. Now, shortly after the review appeared, the seminar met, this faculty seminar I was a part of, for what I think was the last time. Erickson himself was not present. I suspect he was embarrassed and he was shaken by the review. The rest of us in this seminar, most of whom were Jewish, were stunned by the intensity of Berman's attack. Most of us had no idea about Erickson's background. Uh, and the consensus was that whatever the underlying facts, Berman had unfairly attacked Erickson's character. Should a letter be sent to the Times in defense? If so, what should it say? What was interesting about the group is we never discussed the issues relating to Jewish identity that arose, at least for me, from Berman's review. Berman seemed to assume that the way to determine whether someone was a Jewish was to apply the matrilineal principle of Jewish law. Erickson's mother was Jewish, therefore Erickson was Jewish. But did that mean, I asked myself, he had to be forever Jewish? Was his biological father's background of no relevance? Was he not allowed to forge his own identity? Moreover, 
I wondered, had Erickson converted to Christianity? And if so, wouldn't that be relevant? Like others in the group, I was unwilling to criticize Erickson. I wanted to have more facts in, in writing this book. Uh, there's a very good biography of Erickson that I relied on to a substantial degree, and I have learned more. But no one in our group at the time, myself included, posed the most troubling question raised by the Berman Review. Was this man we liked and admired, this man dedicated to identity and wholeness, a self-hating Jew? I was raised to believe it was wrong to try to pass as a Gentile. But when I think about Erickson, I wonder, is it always wrong? What if a person feels no connection to Judaism as a religion or to the Jewish community? What if the burdens of anti-Semitism become unbearable, as they may have been for Erickson growing up in Europe? Why should it be wrong to stop identifying yourself to others as Jewish under circumstances? In other words, why shouldn't you be allowed to opt out? At least I was asking myself these kinds of questions. And it was really, I asked them as an entry point to my own grappling with what it means to be Jewish. And by untangling Erickson's story and my own, I hope to reveal the complex questions of identity that arise when we consider the many different ways in which someone might be said to be Jewish or not. Let me tell you briefly about a second story. In some ways, the seed for this project was planted in a family dinner table conversation in Oxford, England, when my daughters forced me to confront the puzzling question of who counts as Jewish and my own ambivalence about being Jewish at the time. I was spending a sabbatical semester in Oxford, England with my family. My wife, Dale, and I had enrolled our two daughters, Jennifer, then 11, and Allison, eight, in English schools. Over dinner one night at the start of the school year, Jennifer told us about her new class, RE, Religious Education. It was taught by the formidable headmistress, Miss K. Jennifer reported that Miss K began the class by asking, who here is of the Anglican faith? According to Jennifer, nearly all the girls raised their hands. Miss K then asked, who is a Presbyterian? A few more hands. Catholic, a couple hands. Baptist, Jennifer didn't remember whether there were any Baptists in the school. Uh, finally, Ms. K turned to the class and asked, is anyone here not of the Christian faith? I asked Jennifer, what happened next? Well, I raised my hand and Ms. K said, and what are you, my dear? And I told her, I'm Jewish. Ms. K paused for a second and then said, oh, how interesting. <laughs> then she asked whether my parents would object if as part of this course, we read parts of the New Testament as well as the Old. I told her you would not object. Well, Dale and I told Jennifer that she had responded quite appropriately. Now, trying to be psychologically sensitive, I asked to Jennifer, well, how did you feel about all of this? Jennifer looked hard at Dale and me, and she said, when are we going to become Jewish? <laughs> Dale and I were a little stunned. I responded slightly defensively, your mother and I have always thought of ourselves as Jewish. We're not really religious, but we are Jewish. Implicit in Jennifer's challenge was, well, what does it mean to be Jewish? Who should count as a Jew? Left unsaid, but implicit in <clears throat> my response was the idea I'd grown up with. Being Jewish was not something you needed to choose to become. You just were, whether you liked it or not. By birth, Dale and I were Jews, therefore so was Jennifer, descent alone was enough. Now one thesis of my book is that for my grandchildren's generation, this will no longer be true. It's gonna be a matter of choice. Now to her credit at the time, Jennifer was not satisfied with my response. And she shot back, you know, when I said, we always were, she's, you know, uh, uh, I said, I'm not sure what she meant. And she, out of the blue, said, I wanna be bat mitzvah. She was 11. Now, Dale and I looked at each other baffled. <laughs> Where had this idea come from? Not from us. Neither Dale nor I had ever been bar or bat mitzvah. We'd grown up here, Dale was in St. Louis, Kansas City, in highly assimilated families. Our parents and grandparents were longtime members of Reformed Jewish congregations, which at the time did not celebrate bar or bat mitzvahs. 
No Hebrew school for us. Instead, like our Protestant friends, we'd been sent to Sunday school at our temple until 10th grade when we were confirmed. Twice a year, our parents took us to services on the high holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We received presents for both Hanukkah and Christmas. It's quite a good deal. The latter celebrated as a secular holiday with gifts under a Christmas tree. To that point in our children's lives, we had done even less than our parents had done. In terms of providing a religious education, we not bothered to join any congregation, even after the children were born. Neither of us had felt any urge to become observant, and unlike the Midwest during the 1950s, we felt no community pressure to join a synagogue or temple. In my book, I note there's a wonderful book by a man named Will Herbert called Protestant Catholic Jew, which captured well what, for me, it was like growing up in Kansas City. Kansas City in the 50s, you had to belong to one of the three teams, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew. And I didn't know any Jews in Kansas City who didn't belong to a temple or synagogue. And when I went away to college, I met these guys from New York who were unaffiliated, but you know, culturally, in other ways, very deeply Jewish. But in the Midwest, that wasn't so. People belonged. Now, one of the four challenges I identify in the book was characterized by our behavior. And that is, uh, the American, it, it, for, for many in the American Jewish community, the commitment to Judaism as a religion is thin. While the overwhelming majority of American Jews, according to Pew, some 95%, report they take pride in being Jewish, with the exception of the Orthodox, we American Jews are less observant than our Christian neighbors, at least if measured by attendance at religious services or membership in a church or synagogue. Uh, many Jews are not believers. Uh, nearly half of Pew's respondents, say, Jewish respondents, say they're agnostic or do not believe in a personal God at all. 22% uh, of the Pew respondents uh, reported they have no religion, what Pew called Jews without Judaism. That figure balloons to nearly a third for millennials. So this is a big challenge because historically, temples and synagogues were at the center of American Jewish life. The second challenge facing the American Jewish community uh, also relates in some ways to our family. My second story is about the youngest of my four grandchildren, Eli Alcott. The name on his birth certificate is Cornelius Alcott VI. You can imagine, I found it sort of preposterous in, in that sense. <laughs> but with our enthusiastic blessing, our daughter Allison married a wonderful young man named Corey Alcott, whose real name is Cornelius Alcott V. His father, Neil Alcott, is Cornelius Alcott IV. When I said to Allison, and she said they were going to name their child Cornelius VI, I said, my God, this is getting, this is sort of <laughs> dynastic, this is crazy. And she said, oh, Dad, we're not going to really call him Cornelius. That's much too presumptuous a name. And I said, what are you going to call him? And she said, Eli. <laughs> I knew I'd lost the battle. Why? Because Dale's deceased father's name was Eli. Shows what an effective negotiator I was. See? And she, so it's Cornelius VI. Well, in all events, it was no big deal to Dale or me, nor to the Alcotts, that Allison was Jewish and Corey was not. That Allison married someone who was not Jewish is hardly exceptional. Today, among Jews in America, intermarriage is the norm, not the exception. The statistics are stunning. Since the year 2000, 50%, 57% of American Jews who married wed non-Jews. <clears throat> this is a stunning change. Traditional Jewish law prohibited intermarriage. Indeed, among observant Jews, they would, quote, sit shiva, say the prayer for the dead, if someone married outside the faith. In my grandparents' generation, intermarriage for Jews was exceedingly rare. The estimates are that about 2% of Jews in the first decade of the 20th century intermarried. <clears throat> Steady and now explosive growth has continued since then. In my parents' generation, it was unusual. In my own, in our generation, <clears throat> it was much more common, but still the exception. But for our children, it's, in our generation, uh, it's even the norm, uh, as I, I gave you the statistics. <clears throat> Indeed, if you put aside the Orthodox that are only 10% of the American Jewish world, the intermarriage rate is above 70%. 
Now, many Jews believe that intermarriage is the greatest threat to American Jewish <coughs> community and its survival. And until recently, American Jewish leaders, including nearly all rabbis, focused discussion on how to prevent or discourage intermarriage. I disagree with this approach. This approach may work to inhibit Orthodox youth, and I think parents should be free to raise their kids as they wish, but I think it's a foolish general strategy and it's doomed. And the reason it's doomed is because American Jews are deeply integrated into American life and we're a pretty small minority, about two or three percent. It's not surprising that people marry and fall in love. Moreover, the meaning of intermarriage has radically changed. In my grandparents' generation, a decision of a Jew to marry a non-Jew usually reflected a conscious decision and often a desire to leave the fold and to leave the Jewish community, both internally and that's the way the community also viewed it too. Now, in no sense does it mean that, that the Jewish spouse in an intermarriage wishes to abandon in some way their Jewish identity. Now, I'm happy to report that intermarriage is now approached, and I think this is what my book argues for, with the goal of engaging intermarried couples in Jewish life. And I think there are reasons to be optimistic. A recent study in the Boston area showed that over 60% of the children of mixed marriages were being raised as Jews, typically with the encouragement and support of the non-Jewish parent. Indeed, in America today, thousands of children of mixed marriage are being raised as Jews, really with the active participation of their non-Jewish spouses. I'm happy to report that our grandson Eli Alcott, now 14, celebrated his bar mitzvah this past year. Now Eli is, is both his nickname and his Jewish name. Uh, but Eli, like all my grandchildren, is a work in progress. What they're gonna make of their own Jewish identity later in their life is not for me to determine. It's gonna be for them to determine. I'm gonna say a few words about a couple of the other challenges. Uh, 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 one I've, I've already, uh, uh, two, two I've already dealt with. One is the, the comparative lack of observance of religious commitment on the part of many, and the second, intermarriage. The third really relates to Israel. The 2013 Pew survey suggests that caring about Israel is an element of what most American Jews think being Jewish means. Support for Israel and a commitment to its survival has long contributed to American Jewish identity. Indeed, I must say that for me, uh, pride in and support for the state of Israel is something that I grew up to take seriously. Today, I very much fear that for the younger generation, the opposite is becoming true. Certain present day policies of the Israeli government now fuel intense conflict among American Jews and reinforce deep divisions within the American Jewish community. At issue in my mind are two aspects of Israeli governmental policy. The first is Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the continued military occupation of the West Bank and the expansion of settlements there. The second, is the exclusive and official role of the Orthodox rabbinate in defining for Israel what is authentic Judaism. Both are political issues uh, and both are uh, in, involve intense conflict within Israel and they both relate to what I think is Israel's core challenge, which is how to manage the tension between being both Jewish and democratic in the face of serious security concerns. Well, let me conclude simply by saying, because of the trends I identify, and the fourth trend really relates to anti-Semitism, where I think there's been the most stunning change during my lifetime. My grandparents here in Kansas City faced substantial anti-Semitism. My grandfather in 1924 bought a home on, at 801 Westover Road. I was telling Crosby, he took pride. It was literally a block down from where Crosby's great-grandfather lived. He had to buy that house through a straw because the country club district was restricted. Uh, country clubs were segregated. 
My school, PEMDAY, I'm sure had an informal quota. Uh, uh, there were law firms and industries that Jews couldn't enter. That's all gone by the boards. And it's a remarkable change. There is no institutionalized anti-Semitism and discrimination against Jews in America. And notwithstanding, I'm not saying there are no anti-Semites in America. Who could have lived through the last couple of years and think that after the march in Charlottesville and the terrible murders in the Pittsburgh synagogue? But I think it's terribly important for American Jews to keep in mind that in terms of this game of comparative victimization, in America, Jews are doing really well. And indeed, a Pew study two years ago asked people to compare what they thought generally of different religions. Who knows whether this is going to last? And guess who came out on top? Jews were the best thought of, of any of the major religions. OK, well, what's that have to do with in terms of a challenge to the American community? Well, part of what has helped keep the tribe together was anti-Semitism. Indeed, I think what, what, through my study, what I really came to realize is the extent to which a part of Jewish identity is the notion that in the diaspora, we've always been a minority, we've been discriminated against, and we're at risk. And I'm not saying that there shouldn't be continuing vigilance, but I'm saying I think if you ask most young people, and I have, anti-Semitism has played no real role in their lives uh, because of, of these changes. Now, let me conclude by simply saying that uh, my book proposes, I was teasing Crosby earlier, that um, I, I propose my own standard uh, that the New York Times said was revolutionary and perhaps heretical. And this, uh, it pleased me that I might be the first Jewish heretic since Spinoza. <laughs> now, my standard uh, is a two-pronged standard. Forgive me, this is a little law professor-ish, but I can't help it. For the American Jewish community as a whole, I propose what I characterize as a big tent standard. Who counts as Jewish? Anyone who wants to publicly self-identify himself as being Jewish. I don't care who their mother is, I don't care who their father is, and I don't care whether they've religiously converted. And indeed, the community as a whole, I want it to be liberal, welcoming, and uh, embracing. Under the big tent, there are all kinds of institutions. Some are religious. They range from humanistic Judaism, which doesn't even acknowledge a, go a god. Uh, their prayers don't use, don't use the word. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the Haredim or ultra-Orthodox at the other extreme in between. There's reform, reconstructionist, conservatives, non-denominational, all sorts. My own view is under the big tent, each of these institutions, they can set whatever standard they want for membership, but they can't impose it on the community as a whole. Moreover, there are all kinds of non-religious institutions. There are Jewish museums, Jewish film festivals, Jewish federations, uh, Jewish community relations groups, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, NGOs. Many connected, some with Israel. They too, as far as I'm concerned, can have whatever standards they want for their own institution. But what I'm asking for, and I think it's critical for the American community as a whole, is that we be tolerant and embracing and have a broad and open definition. Uh, now, inside this big tent, the table is set with a smorgasbord of Jewish values, music, food, traditions, rituals, spirituality, language, philanthropic causes, and connections with Israel. In my book, I do not try to tell anybody whether they should be a Jew or not, or how they should be a Jew. And at this table, some will nibble, others will feast, but all will have options and none should be turned away. Under the tent, of course, people should be encouraged to stay and to affirm their identity rather than lapsing into apathy. I think each of us who identify ourselves as Jews ought to think seriously about why we care about being Jewish. Each of us might, should take responsibility for educating ourselves about our heritage. 
and finding what may be meaningful for ourselves. In a very real sense, I argue that the chosen people must become a choosing people. Thank you very much. I'd be, I'd be glad to take questions, comments. I'd be glad to. Yes. Any questions? Yes. They were college age. Anyway, the, que the question is, uh, your children in school, is that right, your children? My kids are 19, 22, and 25. And, and in school, they experienced, high school. in high school, they experienced uh, uh, anti-Semitism. Yeah. And the, uh, look, uh, anti-Semitic stereotypes still are out there. There are stereotypes about women. There are stereotypes about every group you can imagine. Uh, and I, I, I'm, uh, uh, and I, I regret, you know, and look, in schools, kids do nasty things. Uh, on the other hand, I guess what I want to underscore is institutionalized anti-Semitism is a thing of the past. Your children's educational, economic, political opportunities, in my mind, will be unaffected should they wish to proudly identify themselves as Jews. I mean, there may be people who are prejudiced against folks uh, because we're from Kansas City. And I, I, don't, I, mean, I don't mean to, to belittle it, but what I'm really saying is I think we've got to keep it in perspective. That doesn't mean that it, when uh, people engage in anti-Semitic tropes, uh, they shouldn't be called out for it. But I think we've got to keep it in perspective. And I think that I am... Um, I have studied carefully the data on anti-Semitic, quote, incidents. And all, I, all I'm saying is there are some things that are profoundly serious. Look at Pittsburgh. Uh, but in fact, uh, a lot of the um, uh, things that are incidents and should be characterized as such are ones in, that, in my view, in the grand scheme of things, aren't don't affect people's life chances in America. Now, I also want to be very clear. I think America is different and special in that regard. Also, America has not always been like that. As I indicated, there have been big changes in my lifetime. But uh, my real argument is not to say there aren't any anti-Semites. Of course, there are uh, some. But I just don't see that generally as a huge problem. Now, I, I think I'm terribly worried about the rise of white supremacists. And I think the hostility towards immigrants and Muslims today is horrific, much more pervasive, and I think politically much more serious, because you have political figures uh, you know, explicitly uh, 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 saying things about a judge because of his, his, of his Hispanic background, right? Uh, I, I, you know, I'll give you one example, then I'll say, uh, 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 when, when people say to me, oh my God, anti-Semitism in America, you know, maybe we've come through a period where it's like the Germans where things were kind of good and they got terribly bad. First of all, in Germany, they were never nearly so good as they are here. That's a myth. There were political parties that were running on anti-Semitic grounds even before the Nazis, okay? Second, I, 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 I use the following anecdote. I say 2008. People look at me and say, 2008? What's 2008? I say, well, what happened in 2008? 
And they say, oh, there was a big financial crisis in America in 2008. And I say, yes, and, and the collapse of what firm was at the center of that crisis? And they say, Lehman Brothers. And I say, and what other firm made billions as a result of it? And they say, Goldman Sachs. And what I say is, your grandmother, knowing those facts, would have said, there is going to be pervasive, popular anti-Semitism that's going to break out in America. And what happened? Next to nothing. OK? That's a big change. I mean, you compare that to America in, in the 30s or even during World War II. Big change. Yes, sir. Well, you know, in fact, I think that one, one striking thing about Israel more than the United States, um, most people in America who identify as, Jew as Jewish have Ashkenazi heritage. Israel is much more diverse in that regard. And to, to, in Israel, to see the variety of hues, racial and otherwise, is really quite interesting. Also in America, too, to some degree. That's true both because of converts and others. Uh, but um, in all events, um, I, I, uh, I, I uh, in my younger days, people thought I looked like Sammy Davis Jr. Oh. <laughs> I didn't say that. I know. <laughs> yes, sir. He was a friend of mine in college. Yes. His brother remains a very dear friend. So, and, but he writes this book talking about how he was cut off from his heritage, from his roots, and how he spent, after marrying uh, his wife, Rachel. Who converted. They, she was not Jewish and converted. Be became a rabbi, yes. He became one of the most influential rabbis in America. But, but his point was that it's important to delve your history to reconnect with your history, to find out what's underneath being Jewish other than just saying I belong or that I, you know, I, I belong to a club. And my concern from listening to what you say is that we'll end up with a generation of orphans in history that a generation down the road will have no connection other than bagels, locks, and a, 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 a couple of songs. I think that's a, your, the, to repeat the question, the concern is he, uh, he, he described how uh, Paul Cowan, who grew up in a very assimilated family, his father, Nay Cohen, uh, had been president of CBS. And his father uh, was so estranged from his father, Cohen, that Paul never even met his grandfather, OK? And that's what sort of made him orphan-like in many ways because of the attempt to cut him off uh, from those roots. Uh, first, I, I uh, uh, love learning more about my roots on both the Manukan side and the Sittenfeld side. And I feel a deep connection. I mean, I take great pr The book is dedicated to my grandfathers, uh, Jacob Manukan and George Sittenfeld. Um, and I applaud that. What I don't applaud is the notion that dissent should be really the way to define who counts as Jewish. Uh, and the reason I feel that's wrong and why in America I think it will be very costly is because of literally the hundreds of thousands of young people who are being raised as Jews in mixed families, 
where they don't have Jewish heritage on both sides, and they're going to be putting together a hybrid heritage of sorts. And that doesn't mean that many of them won't, won't be much more religiously observant than I am, and that may not be committed deeply uh, to their Jewish identity. And what I object to, I mean, I, I, have, I have a very ambivalent feeling, you know, there are all kinds of jokes uh, uh, about a young Jewish couple, each of whom do 23 and me. And the woman turned out to be 91% Ashkenazi. And uh, the guy was 78% Ashkenazi. And she says to him, I always knew I was more Jewish than you were. <laughs> you know? And I think what's really, I have a whole chapter about race, which is plenty complicated. Because on the one hand, I describe how as a Jew, how offended I am when I hear people describe Jews as a race. Because we all know the historical background of that, right? During the Third Reich. On, on the other hand, you know, uh, all this genetic stuff, there is no Jewish gene. It's only correlational and it, it's kind of geographic. Uh, and uh, it, it may be that many of us are 19th cousins of some sort. But I guess my own feeling is in America, a better way to think about it is as an individual, what's your commitment going to be to your heritage? Sorry for the long-winded answer. Martha. So this is a personal question. Growing up in the house that you did and observing Passover with a grandma who made capilta fish in her bathtub, <laughs> it stunk up the whole place. I will never forget it. How did that childhood not have an impact on your adulthood? It certainly did. You know, the, the, the question is, my paternal grandparents, uh, uh, my grandfather was a, I think he was president, and he was, he was a big shot in Kehillath Israel, which is uh, uh, a traditional synagogue. Uh, it is, I, I'll tell you an amusing story about Kehillath Israel. Uh, uh, I said to some students of mine that in Kansas City, the Orthodox synagogue had mixed seating, to which my Orthodox student said, impossible, it cannot be. And I say, look, my, my paternal grandparents were big shots in what was an Orthodox synagogue, and they had mixed seating. He says, cannot be. Well, I went to the web, the wonder of the web, and looked up Kehillath Israel's history. And it turns out in the 1950s, I was right. Kehillath Israel decided to have mixed seating. But what I hadn't known is they were kicked out of the Orthodox group <laughs> as a result. The other thing I learned about my Manukan grandparents is I, my father had a sister who tragically died when she was 16, uh, around 1935. She was confirmed at B'nai Yehuda. So my, you didn't know that about Jake and Dina. They belong to the temple as well as Kehillath Israel and had sent their daughter, okay? Last story about my Manukan grandparents, who they did not eat pork. They you know, kind of kept kosher. We went over there every Friday night for dinner. I describe this in the book uh, with my parents. And uh, literally, Working on this book, I realized that, of course, was Shabbat dinner. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, I never saw any prayers. No, I think there were candles lit, but I think my grandmother did it, perhaps out of deference to my mother, who was not, did not take well to things orthodox, I guess is one way I, I could sort of say it. But, but they, they, um, the, these Friday nights, I viewed it as being with my grandparents, and it wasn't real. I'm sorry they didn't, but I describe in this book how one of our, my regrets, I'm not sure Dale regrets as much as I do, is that we did not celebrate, I think celebrating Shabbat with your children on Friday nights is an incredibly wonderful thing, and I regret that we didn't do that. But I grew up with it, but I grew up with it at a time and a place where I didn't know it had any religious meaning at all. 
It was just being with my grandparents. So has this changed your behavior now? Uh, if you mean, has it shaped my behavior in terms of my becoming more observant? Yes. No. Uh, has it shaped my behavior in being much more committed? Yes. Um, um, and I, uh, in a variety of ways, but they aren't, you know, uh, they aren't so much religious. And it, it, you know, in the book, I confess that I wish that spiritually I felt a connection with Jewish rituals because I think through the religion is really the most, is a very effective way of passing on something uh, to your uh, to youngers. And I, but I'm, I'm being honest about it and that's the way it is. Anne. Um, as I texted you while I was reading the book, one of the things I loved so much was reading the book, I felt like I was talking to you because I know you so well. But one of the things that you touched on that I do think is a major concern for all of us has to do with the future of sort of organized religion. And particularly from a Jewish, and I know our rabbi has said that a lot of ministers are concerned about the same thing. Um, I think it is really important for rabbis to embrace mixed marriage. I know Orthodox don't, and I know that um, conservatives are a little bit more, and I know that, that it's not that long ago that the CCAR adopted for Reformed Jews more a much more embracive approach. And I see it in our own children who are married to people who were not brought up Jewish. They haven't converted, but the kids in some of the family, the kids are going to Sunday school and the kids are being brought up Jewish. And how the rabbi treats right. the non-Jew is critical. Because I've seen both sides where a friend of mine here in Kansas City said that she quit their, she was brought up conservative, she quit their temple because her husband wasn't Jewish and the rabbi said, I just want you to know that when your child has a bar mitzvah, you will not be allowed to do this and this because you're not Jewish. And I look at our son-in-law who, they belong to a great congregation in um, uh, New Haven and the rabbi was fabulous and so for our granddaughter's bar mitzvah, they're, they're bringing in the rabbi from from New Haven, who is doing the bat mitzvah in Pittsburgh, because he's more know, embracing. It's more embracing. Yes, and, right. And he does a better job. So I hope that, as organized religion, the people who are thinking about tomorrow, the congregations, the rabbinical movement, are really thinking about where we want to be and how we can be embracing. I, of course, couldn't agree more. And indeed, it's the argument I'm making. And I, and I have to report. Uh, a, a number of rabbis have read the book and written me about it and have been extremely generous. Uh, in Los Angeles, I'll, I'll tell you one anecdote that really moved me. Uh, a rabbi who was the head of a very large congregation, Reform, uh, told me two stories. <clears throat> the story that related to the book was as follows. This reform congregation was very unusual in that it had a day school affiliated with it. There aren't many reform Jewish day schools. But they also had a religious school. They also had a preschool program. And he said there are 700 kids in their various educational programs. And he said to me, I want to tell you how your book influenced me. And I said, oh, really? He said, yes. He said, we have a teacher in the day school who is not Jewish and is a wonderful teacher. She's been a teacher for several years. She asked if her children could attend the school. And we had a policy that to attend the school, you had to have a Jewish father or a Jewish mother. So we said no. And he said, I read your book. And I went back to our board. And I said, we can't do this. She's part of our community. Of course, we should have their children in the school. That made me feel very good. And I think there are all kinds of ways where, uh, and as you say, you know, that, but, but it's slow. Um, and. Um, Can I interject one more thing? 
in the credits, <laughs> in the credits, which I, because I know you so well, I wanted to read the credits and find out historically. And I saw our dear friend Rick Schwader listed, and knowing that he's a cultural anthropologist, uh, was, was your discussion with him having to do with the groups, the, the college campuses that have been uh, not encouraging campuses to bring Israeli students because of the Israeli-Palestinian issue? Or was it something else? It was something else. <laughs> it was about circumcision. Oh, I know that, I know that well. <laughs> no, no, but, but uh, and it was, he wrote me a long, a after the book came out, he says, you didn't deal with circumcision, which he's very interested in for anthropological reasons. Uh, yeah, as you know, right. Yes, ma'am. Um, could you say more about what you meant when you said you were not more religious, but you were more committed? The question is, what did I mean when I said, I'm not more religious, but I'm more committed? Uh, uh, it's a great question. And uh, uh, I wrote this book because I uh, very much, I, I saw many people in my generation and folks a little bit younger whose children were intermarrying with our blessings uh, and who cared and took pride in being Jewish, but were not having conversations with their children about it at all. We're avoiding. Because after, after all, we don't want to tell people how to be religious. We don't know quite how to do it. And I, part of my motive in writing the book was to uh, share uh, some of the things I'd learned and to say to people who may not be religiously observant, but who, for whom being Jewish is important, look, there's lots more you can learn and have the conversations. Uh, uh, figure out why it's important to you and be prepared to talk to your kids about it. In the last chapter, I sort of encapsulate m my own, uh, uh, sort of what I'd say to my grandchildren uh, about why it's important to me. And uh, I do it in terms of uh, what I call the Jewish head, the Jewish heart, and the Jewish heritage. And the head is just the notion that we're people of the book, that debate is relished, arguments relished. Uh, it's okay to argue with God. Uh, it's okay not to believe in God, in a sense. And the heart is, at B'nai Yehuda, the one thing that was drilled into me was a, a sense that uh, as part of my Jewish values, I had a responsibility to help heal the world, not just for Jews, but for others. And the heritage I've learned more about now. It's quite a story. But I think that's what it is for me. Others ought to figure it out what it can be for them. But I think it's in the sense of uh, struggling. This is the hardest book I ever wrote. This was not easy for me. Yes? I'm curious, when your daughter asked you, when were you going to become Jewish? Yes. What did she say and what did you do? <laughs> Well, we, when we went back to Berkeley, we joined a reformed temple. And you know, we warned her. We said, Jennifer, you know, you're going to have to probably give up ballet and some other things if you're going to do this. And you don't have much time left. And you may not be able to do it when you're 13. But we, uh, uh, we, we did join a temple. Our younger daughter, Allison, uh, by the way, uh, uh, said to, we were sending Jennifer to Sunday school. I said, Allison, you're going to go too. And she said, this is Jennifer's thing. <laughs> and I said, Jennifer, I'm paying dues. You're going to. And then, then as I describe in the book, I bribed her. She was into horses at the time. I said, well, now look, if you stick with it and you get bat mitzvah too, we'll maybe get you a horse when you're 13. And, and thank God, by the time she was 13, she'd lost interest. <laughs> so we didn't have to do that. But uh, we responded by joining a, 
by joining a congregation. And, and because in fact, I think that in fact, education, the thing, the worst problem is American Jews are not very well educated about our religion for the most part. And that's very sad. On the other hand, today among adults, there is an enormous thirst for learning more. I mean, Jewish educational classes are incredibly oversubscribed uh, in all sorts of ways. I think that's a very promising sign. Yes, last question. I really want to thank you and compliment you on the amount of work that you did to write this book, because now that I have a PhD in my family, I know the importance of footnotes. And you have several pages of footnotes, and, and that's, that's a tremendous uh, commitment. Um, there's so many things that are Jewish about you. One of my teachers, Alan Edelman, said, should I learn about this or should I do something? Because that may be right. done in a moment. And he said, first you have to learn. And so every professor is a student first. And, and you have been both a student and a professor. And that's a very, very Jewish uh, experience. But my question is about the Big Ten. If I wanted to say I'm a professor at Harvard in law, I don't know that I could carry that off, but I could say it. I'm self-identifying as a Harvard Law professor. So you mentioned the learning all the way through. And so how can we, without the learning, I'm not saying what you choose after you learn, but without the learning, how can you self-identify any more than I can say I'm a Harvard professor? Well, I, I you know, look, I turn the question around, and, and I'd say, how do so many people who were born with a Jewish mother who say they're Jewish, who don't know anything. Why? They haven't educated themselves. It's only because of dissent. And what I'm saying, uh, look, I, in the book I even say that if I thought there could be agreement about what core learning you should have, uh, I'd be in favor of some form of secular conversion. But that's a fantasy. There can't be. Moreover, the other, this is just sort of a lawyer's argument. Turns out in Israel, as you know, there, was, there is the law of return. It's at the core of Zionism. The law of return is that a Jew can come and become a citizen of the state of Israel. And it's subsidized in all, sort of, all sorts of ways. From 1948 to 1957, as my book describes, you know what the test, the statute did not define who counted as a Jew. And guess how they determined it? Self-identification. If someone arrived and they said they were Jewish and they wanted to participate in building the state, in fact, a ministry issued regulations saying you must not inquire. We don't want any investigation. Now what happened around 1958 is uh, an Orthodox party that was part of Ben-Gurion's government went crazy. And Ben-Gurion sent a letter out to notables saying, well, how should we decide who counts as Jewish? And half the letters were sent to rabbis. And guess what came back, <laughs> right? But I, I say that because, in fact, my self-identification standard you know, is not quite so crazy. Moreover, as you know, in the Old Testament, all lots of the patriarchs married women from other tribes, and there's no talk of conversion or their children not being part of the tribe. So I think the matrilineal principles pedigree in that sense, I, this, I rely on scholarship of others for this because I'm not a biblical scholar, isn't quite as strong as one might think. But I think your, your question's a fair one, and that is, you know, uh, moreover, with, last point, with respect to identity, I recognize that how you describe yourself publicly, I think, should be, for the big tent, the critical issue. But there's always the question of how other people, if you're identifying as part of a group, how other people who are members of the group view you can have some influence. So how other Jews view you can influence you, and psychologically it can have a great cost. On the other hand, how people outside the group view you can also influence you, okay? So I, I'm not, 
I, I, I'm not simple-minded enough to think that you can entirely, you're free to create yourself any way you want. But I think given that in fact, in America, there's no one way to be Jewish at all, and people express their being Jewish in so many different ways, I would just as soon have a standard that is quite open. And I'd hope they'd then make it meaningful and they would learn things. Thank you very much. <laughs>